Sarah Albadwi here from Horse Racing Nation, pleased to be joined by a morning line maker for Naira and a DRF employee, David Aragona. Thank you so much for taking the time to join me in discussing some Belmont Stakes Day action. I'm really happy to chat with you for the first time. I've followed you for a little bit, but have, we haven't got to do much handicapping together. So excited to talk to you. And we've got a great card to discuss on Saturday. Definitely. And for short fields, we are certainly not lacking in superstar talent. And I think there's still opportunities to be making some money within this all grade one pick five, which is what we're going to be discussing today. And starting off in the Ogden Phipps, Latruska, obviously the heavyweight champion returning. I'll let you start us off here. Do you think that she's still the queen of the distaff division or do you think that it's time for her to be overthrown? You know, she's just really hard to pass when she gets away with that comfortable lead, which uh, happens in most races because uh, there aren't too many horses out there that really want to run with her, at least not those that uh, feel like they have a chance to beat her. So looking at this race, it's a short field, just four rivals showing up to face her. They're definitely the right four rivals because they are all graded stakes, grade one quality horses, but it just feels like there's nobody to really take up that role to push her beyond her limit on the front end. So she's likely to have an easy lead. And I just think she's going to be really hard to run down in that circumstance. So yeah, she, she's likely to defend her crowd in the octave Phipps. I agree with you completely. I wish I had something more creative to offer than a single of Latruska to start things off. But everything that you said from a pace standpoint, it's not as though we're looking at a horse that has shown the ability to press her early and I guess the one that if you are looking for that alternative, the one that you would want to sit and stalk would probably be search results. But she has yet to run a race fast enough to end up being competitive against her in here to get the win. And then you're left with Bonnie South, Malfat, and Clarier, who have all shown that they prefer to come from out of it. So I just don't see that horse that we need to see to press her early in order for her not to continue to be successful. And maybe if you wanted to make the argument that her return race at Gulfstream was one of her lower numbers and maybe she doesn't have the same quality that she had last year and the Breeders' Cup distaff really did her in, but then she came back in the Apple Blossom and replicated her top highest figure and beat Cece and Clarier. It's like, this will be an exciting race, but I think that she ultimately wins it. Yeah, it's just really hard to find those vulnerabilities with her because uh, aside from the Breeders' Cup where she had a legitimate excuse, I mean, she just always shows up in her races. And I mean, I guess you could try to make some of these three-year-olds that have just, or I should say newly turned four-year-olds uh, like Malathot and Clarier, maybe even search results as the possible upsetters because they do have some blue sky ahead of them. But I just have trouble getting there. Clarier had her shot last time. Search results, as you said, needs to get faster. And uh, I know your colleague Ed is very high on Malathot in this race, but I have trouble getting there myself. I uh, just feel like she's one of these horses that aside from the Breeders' Cup, where it felt like everybody got a career best speed figure, her numbers are just not quite as fast as Latruska. So uh, I have to go with, uh, with the speed in here. I'll spare making fun of him in this moment because I was watching the Breeders' Cup Distaff replay earlier and I know how much he loved Dunbar Road and I always kind of feel bad for him every time I rewatch <laughs> that race. So... <laughs> He, he has some out there ideas and when they connect, it's usually at a price. But again, I, I don't see this one being the one. But moving on to what I think is a bit of more of a competitive race in the Jiper Stakes. Uh, we're going six furlongs on the turf. And I don't see a super clear cut favorite in your morning line. But I am sure that you assume that Arrest Me Red is going to end up being that favorite with the connections. Yeah, I mean, I, I pegged him as low as five to two, which uh, is tough to do in a 12 horse field that's this competitive. Uh, it just feels like there are a lot of arrows pointing in his direction, especially from a pace standpoint, because for, uh, or I should say a 13 runner field, uh, for a turf sprint with this many horses in it, there's not that much front running speed signed on. I would guess that the number three true valor could go forward from his inside, but arrest me red. He's perfectly content to stalk outside of another horse. So it just feels like he's supposed to work out the right trip, but I could have said the same thing about Bound for Nowhere, who Wesley Ward sent out as a similar favorite in this race last year. And that pace got unexpectedly fast and Bound for Nowhere ended up getting run down as it completely melted down. So I wouldn't rely too much on Arrest Me Red's pace advantage in here because it feels like somebody among these 13 runners is going to have to get aggressive to go after him a little bit. His form is fine. I wasn't sure overall what I thought of that turf sprint at Churchill Downs on Derby weekend. It was just a race where everybody crossed the line within about 
about two lengths of each other. Typically, those are not the strongest races from a form standpoint moving forward. Others had be- uh, tougher trips in there, like the number 12 gear jockey. So uh, I-, I wanted to take a bit of a shot against Arrest Me Red in here. I mean, the runner that I'm most interested in is actually the defending champion in this race, uh, the number four, Casa Creed. His form is just excellent. Uh, ever since that Jiper win last year, he was impressive that day. They stretched him back out in distance, but uh, he uh, actually ran pretty well in some of those races despite losing. I didn't think he got the best rides from Junior Alvarado a few times. So I like this recent rider switch to Luis Saez, and I thought he rode him well in both starts overseas, particularly too back in Saudi Arabia when he was just barely beaten by Songline, who is a subsequent Group 1 winner in Japan. Uh, from my perspective, Casa Creed is the horse to beat in this race. I really wanted to love Casa Creed. It just kind of worries me a little bit. I always want to give them one when they come back from overseas. And I I loved Get Smokin', obviously a different running style and different horse. And then he just got beat last time out in kind of a heartbreaker getting run down late. So just since he hasn't won since last year's Jiper, I kind of wonder if he comes back in the same exact form that he was displaying overseas. He's obviously a contender. Um, And I wouldn't be totally shocked if he won. I think that once you get past Arrest Me Red and some of the others that are going to be sitting closer early, this race has a little bit more openness to it. And of course, trips will matter as well. But I like Gear Jockey too. Like you said, he always seems to show up and come running late, uh, the Gulfstream Park turf sprint aside. But this is his first time at Belmont. He does get a little more ground to work with. However, I do feel as though this is kind of the time to show up and get a little bit more of a than a piece of it. He's kind of been running along for pieces and not really getting the win over a company like this. And I just want to see that little bit more from him. But I think maybe with the extra distance, that makes the difference. And then Scuttlebuzz is a horse that he hasn't faced this kind of company yet, but his figures fit and they've been progressively improving. He's won his last three. He sat mid-pack last time. And while he did get a pace to run into, I thought that that was a pretty decent performance off the layoff. And I think that while he hasn't faced the class level that he's going to be facing in here, it seems like now <clears throat> could be the time for him to show up and show that he belongs. So I wanted to use him as well. So I went five, eight, and 12 in here for my pick five. Yeah, I like all of the horses you mentioned. I'm really not against Gear Jockey. I agree with you about the ad distance potentially helping him. And I think Scuttlebus is interesting as well. And kind of interested to see what price he goes off at in this race. He was a tough line to make because he's going out for Rudy Rodriguez as a trainer that you don't really think of as having great one turf horses. So I wonder how some betters are going to assess him. But I agree about his last race. It was impressive and he's supposed to be better turning back to six furlongs. Right. And I think people like wins too, regardless of the connections. And they'll see that, especially on a day Mm -hmm. where more of the betting public is just the general public and they'll be playing as well. I think they like to see that in the past performances more than people who play on a regular basis. But moving along to the Hill and Dale Met Mile, we have yet another potential superstar in here. And I get if people want to poke holes in flight line, they're there if you want to create them. Nobody wants to swallow three to five on a horse that's shipping for the first time, that's going this distance for the first time, that seems to run very sporadically and seems to have some issues in getting him actually to the racetrack. He's only making his fourth career start, but just the speed that we've seen from him, he's freaky fast. And I don't really see a scenario where he'll have to, but he has shown that he can sit off of a horse like he did in his second start. He didn't take the lead right away. He did sit and stop before powering away to win in there. And then I feel as though in the Malibu, it wasn't a bunch of nobodies that he was beating. Baby Yoda, Stiletto Boy, Dr. Shivel, those are decent horses. And he's shown that he isn't just a freaky fast allowance type of horse. Speaker's Corner, obviously a great horse. He is accomplished. He's consistent. He's versatile. He's six for nine wins, eight of nine in the money. But does he have the speed to either take it to flight line or can he run him down? I kind of don't know. And I feel like a lot of people are going to want to get creative and use speaker's corner against flight line. And I understand it, but that's not my approach. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, based on what we've seen in him up until now, I mean, Flightline appears to be the kind of talent that we rarely see in this sport. I mean, he just, from day one, has been this horse with freakish ability, and he's shown it in every single start, and it's not like he's needed competition along with him to push him to run these fast numbers. I mean, when he crosses the wire, nobody's in the same zip code as him. At least that's been the case so far. Um, He is stretching out to the mile for the first time. I guess that's the biggest question mark, but... 
the way that he finishes up his races, I mean, he's just powering through the wire with under very little encouragement. I mean, it feels like it's not supposed to be a problem for him. I mean, he's the kind of horse that's bred to go a mile and a quarter. I mean, we'll see if they ultimately get to that eventual goal, the Breeders' Cup Classic. But this is the race that they have to run in. Uh, there is the layoff to deal with, but he's run well fresh in every single one of his starts to date. It's just really hard to to view him losing because of trip or anything like that, the layoff. I mean, maybe speaker's corner junior Alvarado gets really aggressive and tries to go after him on the front end, but that's really not junior style. I imagine they're going to just sit outside of flight line and hope that one doesn't get the distance, but they might be hoping pretty futilely because uh, flight line just seems like he's too talented for this field. I think it's more likely that speaker's corner is kind of gets his heart broken chasing him. And maybe he gets picked up for second. Uh, we'll see if you want to get a horse like happy saver into the exacta, but uh, from a multi-race standpoint, it just feels like flight line is the one to lean on despite the short price. Right. And I hate that I'm doing it, but it's just like either you get really cute and you try to beat him or you just take the single and move on. And that's the approach that I'm taking in here. And other than Speaker's Corner, yes, we have Aloha West, but does he really want a mile as your Breeders' Cup Sprint winner? And the third last time out to Jackie's Warrior, yes, it was off the layoff and it was going the seven furlongs, but even in the Breeders' Cup, he got a very fast pace to close into. And I, I question the distance for him as well as his running style versus a, a freaky fast horse like Flightline. And then Happy Saver, He's hoping, I think, to sit right off of the flight line at Speaker's Corner in that stalking trip. He's been successful with that move before, and I like your idea of possibly getting him into the exacta for some value underneath instead of a straight 1-2. Maybe it's a 1-4 or something like that, and then informative would be quite the shock. <laughs> yeah, his connections have pulled off some shocking upsets before, but uh, that'd be pretty crazy if he was able to beat this field. I, yeah, I don't know if I would recover from that. It would be more surprising than Rich Strike winning the Derby, honestly. <laughs> It'd be up there. In the Resorts World Casino Manhattan Stakes, now we're going a mile and a quarter on the turf. And this race is pretty interesting. This is the spread race for me. I went two, three, four, eight, nine, and 10. And I know it might seem crazy leaving off some of the Chad Brown horses out of his uh, quartet that will be competing in here. But these don't seem like the top of the line, Chad Browns and Limperator, Rock Emperor and Tribuven. And I'm really excited that Channel Maker has been showing that he is still kicking because that win last time out where he had to sit in stock, which isn't his preferred thing to do, going the mile and a half wide on the Keeneland Turf course. I refer to him kind of as my favorite giraffe, as I know a lot of other people <laughs> do as well. And I think that he ends up getting a pretty good trip in here, setting the pace. Um, Gufo, obviously very classy and talented, but couldn't run down Highland Chief last time out where your beers stood in the gate in the Man of War. Highland Chief has some interesting class overseas that he is now making his third career start in the U.S. So I don't think that was a complete fluke of just a, him getting the right trip last time. I think that he is actually talented and does belong in a group like this. But obviously you'll want to see an effort that's decent enough again. And then Tokyo Gold, I know it's kind of a crazy shot, but I think it's really interesting that they are coming back here after two efforts here last year, one where he was second to Bolshoi Ballet in the Belmont Derby. He would obviously have to improve to win this race, but I like him a little bit underneath because I think it's a bit of a curious move that they want to return to the States. Yeah, this is a wide open race. It feels like the best race of the day on Saturday from a wagering standpoint. You can really make cases for a lot of horses. Uh, there's no clear leader of this older male turf division right now. It's not like last year where it seemed like domestic spend, spending was on the ascent and just about to take control of this division. Uh, no horse is kind of on the precipice of that here. So uh, a lot is to be decided in this Manhattan. As you were saying, you have horses turning back in distance like channel makers, some that are stretching out from the mile and an eighth that they tried in that turf classic at Churchill down. So it's really interesting to have this race be a mile and a quarter. It's kind of bringing together those two kinds of specialists. Um, my strategy in here is to just kind of fade some of the shorter prices that I'm not that confident in. And among them would be horses like the number two Gufo, 
I think the mile and a quarter is just a, a little bit on the short side for him. He, I, he's not the to- most reliable horse to work out a trip in a large field for me. So, um, well, I respect him. He's just not the right horse for me from a wagering standpoint in here. Uh, Santine is a horse that I'm not going to be surprised if he takes another step forward because he has all of this upside. He's kind of the one that you could kind of fit into that domestic spending mold like last year when he uh, won the Turf Classic and part, then really uh, cemented his position with the win in the, the Manhattan. But I don't know. He he was raining on that Churchill Downs turf course that seemed like some horses were loving it, some were hating it. He obviously really enjoyed the going that day. And he was a price last time, went off at seven to one. I feel like he's going to be about half that price, if not less in here. So um, I, I was having trouble really justifying him from a value standpoint. And as you said, Chad Brown, he's got four horses in this race. I think the one that's going to take the most money is the number four at Hamo. And I get it. Um, he's probably going to appreciate the stretch out to the mile and a quarter. There's going to be some pace in this race or so it seems, and he'll appreciate that as well. I, I can't say that I've loved either of his races in this country. He was closing well at the fairgrounds. Uh, maybe he didn't love the course last time at Churchill. Though it also feels like Chad Brown's kind of had this race penciled in for him for a long time, and both of those are just kind of stepping stones to get here. So I won't be surprised when he runs well, but with Chad Brown in his corner and Flavian Pratt riding, it feels like he's another one that's going to take money. So I wanted to look for some bigger prices. The two that I I would want to focus on most prominently are uh, the number five, In Love, and the number seven, Tribavan. Uh, Tribavan's the Chad Brown horse that I want because – his two best races that he's run before have both come at Belmont park, both when he won the Fort Marcy last year and when he was second, a very good second to domestic spending in the Manhattan last year. And I think they're going to use aggressive tactics. Once again, I know they didn't work in the turf classic last time, but that was one of those days with Churchill, where if you went to the lead and angled over to the rail, you really had no chance. And that was the trip that Tribavan pulled. So I'm not going to get too concerned about the fact that he lost by 10 lengths to Santine. And if he can get back to one of his better races, I think he's a real danger in here. And as for in love, just given the connections, it seems like he's a horse that has to get lost in the shelf from a wagering standpoint, but he has plenty of back races that put in the mix. I know they're going a mile and he's got to stretch out to the mile and a quarter here, but just watching him run, looking at his couple of mile and eighth races that he's tried before, he doesn't strike me as one that has significant distance limitations. I expect a good effort out of him, and I feel like he's going to beat double digit odds. Yeah, I mean, anybody wouldn't really totally shock me in here. You could go in any direction and make a case for pretty much anyone's. I feel like almost all of them have some sort of back race that makes them very competitive in this spot. So wide open in there. And like you said, probably the best on the day from a wagering perspective to try to get some prices into your exotics as well. Moving on to the main event, the Belmont Stakes. Uh, A lot of people seem surprised that you made We the People the favorite, but I get it. You're looking at a horse that is likely the lone speed that improved majorly last time out over the surface. He has plenty of upside. You can toss the Arkansas Derby for a number of reasons if you listen to what the trainer and the connections have said about how he ran his race beforehand and how they've done so much schooling. He won by open lengths last time. And from a tactical standpoint, I I get why he makes sense, but I'm going to go in a different direction here. The horse that I wanted to use as my last single in my pick five is actually going to be Creative Minister. And I said this while talking about this race yesterday. I don't believe he is the best horse in this race, but I do believe that he is likely to get one of the better trips. And I think that he's going to sit in stock outside of We the People. I don't know who, if anybody, might go with We the People early, but I think he sits in that second flight or maybe closer to him than a lot of other horses that are going to be shorter prices like Mo Donegal and Rich Strike possibly as well. He's progressively improving. There were some questions, I think, going into the Preakness. Does he really belong with this level of class? Is he actually of this caliber? I think that his third place effort in there was decent enough. And I do like that he was able to beat Secret Oath. Obviously, she had yet another trip against males that you can kind of forgive her for. Mm -hmm. But I like that he at least did some running and showed up in there, whereas some other horses may have kind of taken a step backwards that were shorter prices than he was. He broke his maiden on a sloppy track. I know the rain isn't as much of a concern now for Saturday. But if it does show up, I'm not worried about an off track for him. And... I just think that he ends up being somewhat of a little bit of value off the six to one morning line where others are going to take more money in here. 
Yeah, I've got no problem with that opinion. I, I do think he's a horse that will be a fair price in this race. I I have trouble. The reason I was against him is I have trouble seeing him take another step forward, just given how much they're asking of him three races in five weeks. He's the only horse that's had that busy a schedule, uh, but he has moved forward at every start so far. So I guess it shouldn't be a huge shock when he moves forward again. Um I won't be surprised when he runs well. He just wasn't for me in this race. Uh, I'm not really proud of my pick in here. I, I went to the horse that I made the morning line favorite, We the People. Um, l- like a lot of people, I assume, I just can't get past the fact that he's the lone speed in this race, and he's probably going to be setting his own pace out front with Flavie and Pratt. Uh, I don't think Pratt is the kind of rider that's going to be too conservative on the front end. We saw the way that he rode Hot Rod Charlie in this race last year. He was really aggressive in that opening quarter, wanted to get some separation. I think he knows that's how you have to ride the Belmont Stakes. So breaking from the rail, I would imagine he's going to open up two to three lengths on this field early and then get into that high cruising speed. And we saw how dangerous We the People is in the Peter Pan last time when he's able to click off those 12 second eighths of a mile. And I'm not that concerned about the distance. Uh, I know he's got to prove it as do many others in here, but just kind of he's this big galloping horse he was even hard to pull up after the peter pan just running all the way out into the clubhouse turn he feels like one that's going to be able to get the mile and a half provided that the trip works out and as you were saying it's just hard to find the horse that really can go with him or even press him that much uh i do think it's possible that creative minister stalking him but i don't think that his connections are going to take him so out of his comfort zone to apply that much pressure the same goes for nest who is another one that i think could be forwardly placed but I, i'm not imagining that they're going to get super aggressive with her either so i landed on we the people um you've explained the reasons why i made him the morning line favorite i know he doesn't come in with sort of the recognizable reputation or name cachet of some others in here but I just think when so many people sit down to handicap this race, he's just got that that lone speed factor staring them in the face. Right. And I think it's everyone is either gravitating towards him or they're going to more Mo Donegal just because of his previous record and the fact that it's Todd Fletcher and you can make a, some excuse that he was wide in the Derby. But Mo Donegal has just really never been my cup of tea. And I think that while I was looking at this race, I could say he might be the best horse in this race, but what trip is he going to get that makes him so much more dangerous at a short price as possibly the second choice, or maybe even he goes off his favorite or something like that. I just don't know that he has that acceleration or that closing kick or that desire to sit closer whatsoever. And he had an opportunity to run a better race. I feel in the Derby, maybe that's being overly critical, but that's just kind of how I see it. He had an opportunity to show up and not finish so closely to Barbara road, who I think isn't of the same caliber of horse as he is. And the fact that they finished so close together in the Derby is kind of a little bit of a red flag to me. And yes, the wood was great and he got a perfectly timed ride and early voting came back and won the Preakness. And that's not all lost on me, but I just don't see him getting the right setup to be successful here for a horse that I would want at a short price. And at least with We the People, even though you're taking a short price, you have the horse that's going to be in front. Yeah, I'm, I'm kind of of two minds about Mo Donegal because I am a fan of his. I actually picked him in the Derby. I, I liked his Wood Memorial quite a bit, but uh, I was left a little bit cold by the performance. I mean, just given the pace setup that he got, I know that he didn't get the, you know, the amazing ride that Sonny Leon gave Rich Strike. He had to go much wider, as you were saying, and probably was left with a little bit too much to do. But still, it's not like he showed some amazing acceleration in the stretch. He was just kind of plugging away, didn't really finish with that same gusto that we saw from him in the Wood Memorial. So maybe getting back to New York is going to really help him. I mean, Todd Pletcher, he just he just knows how to win this race and gets horses to peak in June. Uh, but uh, he, I didn't think he was going to be that much price either. And as you said, given similar prices on both of these horses, I was more confident that We the People was going to get the right trip. So I landed on him, but I was kind of between him and the two Pletcher runners. And I'll just briefly highlight Nest. I don't think Nest is impossible in this race. And I mean, I was looking through the history of how Phillies get bet in these Triple Crown races when I was making the morning line because she's kind of a tough horse to know how the public is going to approach. And the Phillies often don't take that much money in these races, not as much as you would have expected, just given the amount of casual players that are that are involved in the Triple Crown races. So I do think she's going to be a a decent price in here she's got to get faster obviously but when i watch her races she does strike me as the kind of horse that's supposed to get better with added ground and i think she is going to be one of the ones that is in that stalking position gets the jump on some of the plotting closers like especially rich strike so uh i want to have nest in there somewhere just as long as she is a palatable price um she's a horse that i would want to include yeah i agree completely she is my second choice in here and 
for everything you said, her pedigree really suggests that she will excel at this distance, much more so than anyone else's pedigree does. And we know that Pletcher has won this race with a filly before, and that was a much tougher field that Rags to Riches was in, and Nest, I don't think, is Rags to Riches. But for me, it was kind of like if she didn't win the Kentucky Oaks while saving so much more ground than Secret Oaths did, and I went back and watched that race a few times, and I can't make enough of an excuse for her with that trip to not do at least a little bit better than Secret Oath did. That's kind of why I ended up on Creative Minister instead. But if she wins, I won't be surprised, and she's going to be in my exactas as well. Yeah, I mean, it's when I was handicapping this race, I kind of came to the conclusion that We the People is going to draw off win by five lengths, getting a perfect trip, or something's going to cause him to fall apart, kind of like what we saw in Arkansas, and then he'll be nowhere, and it really opens up the race a little bit. Um, so I, I, in that situation, I could see a horse like Nest coming through because I don't have so much confidence in some of these other three-year-olds that ran in the Derby that they're necessarily going to run so much faster in this Belmont Stakes just because they're stretching out to a mile and a half. I mean... I'm not expecting Ritz Strike to run poorly. I think he'll give a solid account of himself. I mean, the Derby performance, it happened. He got a great trip, but he still ran well to win that race. It's just, I feel like the fact that he won and caused this huge upset at 80 to 1, it kind of is lingering in the back of people's minds that, oh, there's just this magic around this horse. Anything is possible. And it's really tough to catch lightning in a bottle twice to get that kind of trip two times in a row. I think he'll run well but I, I think it's more likely that I'll hit the board and probably not win this race. Right. And the likelihood of getting a pace like he did in the Derby again, that's such a rarity to see. Yeah. And I don't see it playing out in this race. And that's why I, I agree completely. I don't expect him to run poorly. He's going to show up, but even during the post draw, when Eric Reed was talking about how they did attempt having him sit closer and taking him out of his running style a little bit to see if he would be effective. And that the answer to that was no, it tells me that this is a man that is thinking about the lack of pace in this race and that wants to give his horse the best opportunity to succeed and realize that that wasn't going to be how he wants to run. So they're stuck having him be kind of this dead closer. And I don't see that being successful in a race like this, where the pace is likely the lone speed of we, the people. Yeah, exactly. I mean, you don't want to be trying to close from last place in a slow paced Belmont stakes. And it just feels like he's the most likely to one fall, to fall into that scenario. So. Right. All right. Well, sounds like we see things fairly similarly with a little bit of disagreement in some of these more wide open races. But I just wanted to say thank you again. I think this is an excellent morning line and I, I'm excited to bet this stakes card. I know that it might seem a little unappetizing to some, but I think that you just have to be creative. And it's also ultimately just a good exercise in handicapping to find where can you find this value? Where can you make more money? Where can you single or spread? And it really just pushes you to actually get a little more creative and figure it out. Yeah, when you have races that look pretty straightforward and smaller field sizes, it forces you to have stronger handicapping opinions and really kind of rely on those. Maybe when you're playing these multi-race sequences, increase the base value a little bit, try to, you know, maybe play your all-A's ticket if you're using an ABC kind of structure, play your all-A's ticket for multiple times the other wagers that you put in. So uh, there are ways to, to do well on these types of days, but you do have to kind of go in with a surgeon's knife and pick your spots. Agree completely. Well, I will say goodbye for now and good luck to everybody on Belmont Stakes Day.